like my queerness is not the defining moments, but a lot of my defining moments are that domestic violence that, you know, my brother and I witnessed and were a part of. And um, I think two blended families, you know, I have that a lot in my family and um, you don't see that a lot in fiction. And so I just, I wanted to bring those to the forefront. And then also I've always just had a big fear of drowning. So it was kind of taking these different ideas and I did want my stepfather to die. Hi everyone, welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. This is Andrew Rimby. I always forget to say my name, so I thought, why not say my name now? Uh, even though most of you know who I am. Uh, so I am so excited because I'm bringing on a really exciting contemporary novelist, a queer thriller writer. Uh, so a la Bathhouse by PJ Vernon, or Micah Nemerever's These Violent Delights. We've had a lot of exciting mm -hmm. queer thriller writers on. So Celia Lasky, who we had for So Happy For You. Um, I'll now put her in the queer thriller camp. Uh, so <laughs> I'm so excited. I want to introduce our guest today. Um, her name is Kelly J. Ford. I want to get the J there because it's in yes. her bio. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> of course. She's the author of the award-winning Cotton Mouse, which is, quote, a novel of impressive depths of character and setting. That was by the uh, LA Review. So I love that. Uh, it was actually named one of the best books of 2017 by the LA uh, Review. Um, she's an Arkansas native, which will be very important as we dig into her new novel. Uh, she writes about the power and pitfalls of friendship, dangers of long-held secrets, and the transcendent grittiness of the Ozarks and their surroundings. Uh, and she lives in Vermont with her wife and cats. Yes. Wanna throw that in there. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to be invoking the South, but she's invoking the beautiful autumnal, uh, you know, uh, New England environment. Indeed. So... Welcome, Kelly Ford, to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Of course. Well, and I think it was important to bring up PJ Vernon because he's the one who really got this all started mm -hmm. a few months ago when, um, or actually, it was probably when he came on last year and he said, oh, I have a friend, Kelly. She writes really gripping psychological thrillers and has this new novel, real bad thing she's writing. And I think you were maybe in your um, manuscript or ending yeah. your revision mm -hmm. process a year ago. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So he, he came out with his book. So we're very close friends and he's one of my beta readers for me. We met at um a writing conference actually actually no we had we did technically but we had the same editor for our debuts but at different publishing houses so I knew that he would be at Bouchercon, the mystery conference that's held every year and I think we were in Florida and I knew that he was with the same editor as me so I just went up to him after a panel and said hi <laughs> I just knew there was something about him I'm like I know we're gonna be best friends um so yeah as, for a few years now we've just really been close and he is kind of my plot master um he helps me figure out a lot of things because I tend to go very character driven and he's like let's blow shit up <laughs> So I well, love PJ. He's a wonderful person, and a fantastic writer. Yeah, well, and something that I definitely, before we jump into Real Bad Things. So Real Bad Things is Kelly's new novel. Um, so Cotton Mouths was your debut novel, is that correct? correct. Okay, so I love that in um, the, well, I don't know if this is an advanced copy, but I think this is in everyone. <laughs> who purchases real bad things also sees the praise that Kelly got for cotton mouths. But I just love how um, the Los Angeles review even pinpoints that your novel features a lesbian protagonist yet sexuality is only one facet of her strongly drawn <laughs> right. character. Right. And this is such an interesting concept about identity and when it comes to gay identity lesbian identity bisexual identity even transgender identity 
Um, right. In real bad things, we have an androgynous type mm-hmm. of gender, non-fluid identity happening. Um, so, you know, how did that sit with you about discussing <laughs> your protagonist and her lesbian identity? Because I think no. it's such an interesting. Facet. Yeah, I mean, and it, it's. I think at the time I was kind of like, I laugh a little bit because I'm like, she's not just a lesbian. She has a life, you know? And so I'm always kind of like, you know, it reminds me of the Us Weekly magazine where it's like celebrities, they're just like us, except put queers. (laughs) So um, I think some ways it's, in some ways it's just people trying to expand the audience for us in their way (laughs) not always um a little clumsy sometimes and that's fine I did the same thing but um you know I think that when I I know when I was writing Cotton Mouse because it took me about 20 years start to finish honestly it was a very long book and it's honestly five different books from the way it started right because it takes such a long time and a lot of revision and I'm just I've seen the publishing industry kind of grow and expand where it kind of was at the beginning when I was coming out with my book, there really was no one that I could really point to in terms of who was writing anything I'm writing because you don't have, like, you can say Dorothy Allison, of course, you know, but not quite. And also, you know, if you're in publishing, which you probably know too, it's like if agents and editors want comps and it's kind of like, well, Dorothy Allison, what has she written in the past five years? Um, so you kind of have to play these games, which aren't necessarily fun, but you know, I'm just happy for any audience I can get. So I don't, I don't mind if people are like, well, she's a lesbian, but there's more to her character because obviously there is. But um, I think to a lot of queer narratives tended in the beginning, the the queer narratives that got published, I should qualify, Mm -hmm. um, were very much coming of age or or trauma porn, I think. Mm. Um, And I think that publishing has expanded the offering since then and I think my book goes into that though I do get into drama and trauma and I love that stuff I don't want to veer away from that and I want people to have coming of age narratives but um I, I'm glad to see that it's expanded so we do have things like bathhouse um and we do have things like by way of sorrow by Robin Geigel you know transgender woman who's an attorney and it's so great um so yeah, it, it's fine with me. I'm happy to have new readers and I'm happy to not just be pigeonholed as a queer writer because obviously there's more to all of us queer folks than just our sexuality or our gender expression. Yeah, well, and I was actually just having this conversation about um, with a uh, collaborator of ours, Pen and Brush, which is this, is this um, female and queer artistic space in Manhattan like they empower new artists and they show their artworks and try to get an audience before to hopefully pitch them to a larger museum Mm -hmm. Um, and there was this whole kind of debate happening and I think in the art world it's so similar to of course in the publishing world or any artist right artists can be author painter actor um uh, academic, but I think that um, there was this debate back and forth about an artist who wanted her work to be defined as, it's okay, it's defined as queer, but she's a lesbian artist just because of her uh, upbringing. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. And I do have to like remind myself that queer, like sometimes in my older audience, especially who are LGBTQ, They'll say, well, I let, you know, I need to identify Mm -hmm. exactly my sexuality because of my coming out journey. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I think it's just so interesting that not to harp on this Los Angeles review, (laughs) because I think it's so, it's also a beautifully done way of opening up an audience. Right, right. right. That's what reviewers are doing. That's what, uh, like you said, publicists do. Uh, They want to get that wide range. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, we'll go there with 
you know, queer Southern writers, which, yeah. you know, has a history, but um, especially in th themes. But I guess what I'm just getting to is, you know, how do you yourself as a writer grapple with, you even mentioned it, that you're a queer writer. Like, mm -hmm. how do you, how do you grapple with that um, being tied to that genealogy of, okay, mm -hmm. now I'm in, I'm a queer writer or, even are you a lesbian writer? I mean, mm -hmm. for them to use the word lesbian kind of implies, okay, well, Kelly herself, mm -hmm. like thinking right, about right. the author's identity. Yeah, yeah, so. I think, I mean, for me personally, I, I kind of switch back and forth between lesbian and queer. And it just, I think because lesbian felt more, um, you know, when I, I, did, I came out, God, years ago, but I was still 25. So I was older when I came out. I was not a, I was not a closeted queer teenager. I might have been, but I was not aware. <laughs> so I just had too many other things going on. Um, so for me personally, just getting older and just feeling, you know, the relationships I've had, I've had relationships with people that don't necessarily, um, identify as a lesbian or don't identify as you know strictly female so it's kind of like for me queer is just an all-encompassing thing um and I it's also too it's like there's LGBTQI and I saw another I and I'm like that's great but for me it's just easier to write queer and I I love the word queer I think it's um nice and succinct, but, um, and I don't mind being, I love being associated with the queer community. I love being a queer woman, a queer person in the world. Um, I love, I'm basically like all queer all the time is how I <laughs> present my mm -hmm. author brand because representation is important, but also I'm not writing towards representation. I'm just writing life as I know it. I'm writing about the characters that interests me. Um, so it, I don't have a hard time with it at all. And probably because I'm older <laughs> and I've already, you know, I'm, you know, getting near 50 and I'm kind of like, I don't really give a shit. <laughs> so oh, that's a good that attitude. Could be part of it. Um, but yeah. you know, I, I, the, the most troublesome things I've dealt with in my life have absolutely nothing to do with my gender or sexual identity. And so that's, those are not the traumas or the life events that define me. So it's mm -hmm. almost like my, my queerness is my side piece. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's like the mashed potatoes. It's not the fried chicken. So, yeah. Hi, this is Andrew. So as some of you might know, I've been such a fan of the Gay and Lesbian Review bi-monthly magazine of history, culture, and politics that publishes essays in a wide range of disciplines, as well as a slew of reviews of books, plays, and movies, and a number of special features, such as artist profiles and the popular art memo column, did you know we actually had two of the writers on the Ivory Tower Boiler Room podcast, Ignacio Darnad and Vernon Rosario? So if you haven't, make sure you listen to those episodes. Each GNLR issue brings you consistently intelligent, lively, thought-provoking articles focused on a unifying theme and brings together the leading minds on the topic. You won't find a lot about the latest dating fads or fashion trends, Though, you might find articles about online dating as a social phenomenon, like Grindr, which I have some experience with, or the gay influence on 20th century fashion. Now, for a special offer. When you subscribe to the GNLR, you'll receive a free copy with any print or digital subscription. That's seven instead of six. Visit glreview.org. That's G-L-R-E-V-I-E-W dot org. Click subscribe and enter promo code ITBR for your free issue. And as an added bonus, you'll receive online access to all archived issues of the magazine. Enjoy your reading. Mm -hmm. 
Your brain needs support, and new Ollie Brainy Chews are a delightful way to take care of your cognitive health. Made with scientifically backed ingredients like Thai ginger, L theanine, and caffeine, Brainy Chews support healthy brain function and help you find your focus, stay chill, or get energized. Be kind to your mind and get these new tropic chews at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Yeah, well, I know we're going to go into those heavy <laughs> topics <Yeah. laughs> uh, with real bad things, but this is just so fascinating because you're having me really which is why I love interviews, self-reflect, because yeah. when I came out, when I was um, 15, I first turned, and now I'm just turned 30, so I have half a life of being yeah. out, which has <laughs> felt actually very transformative and freeing. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of retrospection of, okay, well, when I was looking for what we would now call queer fiction, it was actually gay fiction, and... Mm -hmm they weren't really even out authors. It was Andre Asaman and Anne Rice. And when I think mm -hmm. of the queer South with writing, I think of Interview with the Vampire. Yeah. And I think of even Alice Walker's The Color Purple. Mm -hmm. um, and then like Patricia Highsmith has queer thriller Southern mm -hmm. themes that kind of happen. I mean, even Flannery O'Connor, I think you could see queer non-normative identity happening. Right. With stories so but right. I think it's interesting now that like gay fiction is now queer how queer fiction is now more encompassing but again mm -hmm. it doesn't have to do with the identity of the author because that wasn't my first approach right Anne Rice didn't identify as queer um right but yeah like do you find how did you first um maybe even get into queer southern writing like do you remember some of those authors um, not a time. I mean, aforementioned Dorothy Allison was huge for me. Um, one of the first writers that really, you know, got their claws into me. And then, um, I didn't do, I didn't read a ton of Southern. I'll be honest. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's almost a little too close for me. And, um, especially when I'm writing Southern fiction, it's hard for me to read Southern fiction. It's almost just too much. I don't know if that makes sense, but um, oh, yeah. So you weren't so, reading like Brokeback Mountain, for example. I forgot to mention Annie. Uh, right. <laughs> I actually read a lot of Jeanette Winterson. Um, yes. She written on the body. I loved it was I think that was the first one of her novels that I read that really impacted me. And I love how the narrator of that is on you know you have no idea what gender they are um you just know that they're a person in love with someone who they cannot have and I'm just like super into unrequited love shit that's so fun to read I just love it it's my favorite thing to read and um you know and then later on the passion um by Jeanette Winterson is also very it's it's my favorite book I've read it more than any other book and it's I mean it's set during the Napoleonic napoleonic war so i don't really fit into that category of you know southern writers i feel steeped in southernness but i've also wanted to leave the south right <laughs> like i was like oh i don't want to be here and i went to college in arkansas where i am from and but the only thing i could think of was just like i gotta get out of here so I was always looking for things outside of the world I knew. And so it's only once I left and had a little geographical and psychological space from my home state that I felt like I could really get back into it. Yeah. You weren't trying to compile a genealogy mm -hmm. of Southern writers like no. okay, as you were in that space, but that makes, yeah. that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I and love I, historical yeah. Sarah Waters, read them all, <laughs> you know, yeah. like that's what I love to read. Yeah. And see, I'm a real Southern Gothic. Yeah. Like, I, love Anne <laughs> right. Rice. I love the vampiric. I like mm -hmm. um, A Rose for Emily by William. Oh Faulkner. gosh, of course. Yes. Yes. And I, okay. So getting into real bad things, just because it, this has been so on my mind, I always love to approach novels 
just the visual aspects. I don't know what it is, but I always just come with my own film or TV. Mm -hmm. Just try to envision the scene. I like that's my number one thing when I'm getting into a novel is, okay, what does the character Jane, what does she look like? Like what's mm -hmm. this Arkansas setting? Like how to, yeah. the texture of it. And you do such a good job throwing us, right? Literally throwing us into her psyche. Like I'm like, yeah. wait, <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> where's <laughs> where's the house? Like, where are we? But I love that it's so deep psychologically right away because mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to come with my preconceived notions of, Okay, well, is this kind of like the movie Hereditary? Um, Hereditary. Oh, what is it? Her Hereditary. No. Hereditary. Thank <laughs> okay. you. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you know, you just when you can't say a word. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all the time. I know. Or is it like three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri? I don't know why mm -hmm. that movie was right. playing in my head a lot at the beginning, but well, because of revenge. Um, <laughs> and yeah. How did you know, okay, this is a novel where I really need to start with the psychology of my character. Like, this is where the reader, they're they're going in deep here. Mm -hmm. That is just, that's where I start with all of my stories. I start from the psychology and probably because I wanted to be a psychologist, <laughs> but I, in, in college, I was a psych major for maybe a semester, but I literally could not pass psych stats. It was, my brain just could not get it. And so I was devastated and, um, but it, it, I just, it wasn't going to work out. So, but I've always been really fascinated by I love to read encyclopedias. I have an encyclopedia of crime and punishment. And so I'm always really, that belonged to my grandma. And then my mom stole it from my grandma. And then my mom had me, no, my grandma had me re-steal it back for my mom. One of those. Um, so I've just always been fascinated, not necessarily by the criminal mind, but the accidental criminal, because I do have some of those in my family. You know, I, I was saying recently at a, on a panel, I'm like, you know, my great uncle Riley didn't mean to commit patricide, but here we are, you know? Yeah. So um, stuff like that. I'm really fascinated by if I, I just like people. I'm one of those people mm -hmm. who I was very shy growing up. I was very introverted, but becoming getting older, um, getting more involved in the writing community. I'm just more at ease. And so I really like to ask people their whole deal. And I just love it when people just tell me their stories. I'm like, what's your deal? <laughs> and they never know how to answer me, <laughs> but then they always do. They'll say something random and I'm like, I love the random stuff. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, uh maybe spoilery for something but it's kind of like how do you lose your eye <laughs> you know and it's like take me back through it or those kind of um you know those narratives where or movies where you see the characters in the future they're like 90 years old yes it's yes. like tell me about your life and they tell Almost you like some titanic. devastating shit yeah, yeah. well yeah. titanic is that's Love the that. whole conceit is she's <laughs> right. on her well is she on her deathbed? I mean, I think years, the ending right. is pretty much she's come to right. her conclusion of life of, okay, I now can right. let go. But I actually, I don't know. I'm a huge Titanic film fan. Huge. I think it's so well done. It's it's a testament to yes. cinematography and storytelling. But yes, yeah, so storytelling, I find that so interesting of how you're drawn to this accidental criminal. Mm -hmm. And so are you as interested in I'm a huge headline um, mm -hmm. pop culture person, like the court of public opinion. Yes. I love to see, okay, who gets, who gets the press? Who doesn't like, why is a um, like John Bonet Ramsey case? Mm -hmm. So gripping, whereas I don't know, some, um, a missing, a young missing girl doesn't get any headlines. Like, right. Why do some mm -hmm. cases get, um, plastered everywhere and right. yeah how do you weigh in on that court of public opinion type news 
I mean, I love that. And it plays in pretty, I should clarify love, but it plays pretty heavily in real bad things with um, my fake auto body shop, the two guys who um, run Let's Talk About Mod. And it's based on a real Facebook group um, that someone set up in my hometown. And it, it was like the hard truth about my hometown. And it just made me laugh because it's it's so funny to me, but it's real life. And I think, um, you know, I was, I was a poli sci minor in college and I was always more fascinated in, um, local and state government because I feel like at a national level, it's almost too big. Right. So that's why Mm -hmm. I love writing Southern fiction too, because there's so much that's outlandish about it. You just don't believe some of the stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So that kind of court of public opinion, it happens so much in a small town that, I mean, I read, I read a lot of the, uh, the headlines and headlines, like one of my writing classes, it was like take national Enquirer headlines and use it as a story prompt. And it's so much fun. Um, And then, you know, I'll even look at a death certificate, you know, for a family member. I'm super into genealogy and it'll be like died this way. And I'm like, oh, my God, what happened? So it it just gets my my juices flowing in terms of how will this work? But in terms of, you know, these small towns and especially in a place like Maud, um, the setting of real bad things, it's just a way also to kind of have a Greek chorus, which I think is what a lot of these headlines are, right? It's just like the court of public opinion is a Greek chorus, you know, and it's kind of like weighing in on and providing that public perspective on very personal events, I should say. Yeah. Yeah, Well, and I mean, look at the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp trial. Mm -hmm. I mean, um how much how riveting the media well right and the media has so much say in right what is going to be focused on for the public and you almost have to form your uh go on either side because Mm -hmm. everyone is talking about it and then now you have to weigh in and I You know, I do think, though, Casey Anthony was weighing on me that case Mm. a lot when I was reading your novel, um, just because um, not with the so there's, you know, I think we can reveal there is um, abuse that is at Mm -hmm. the heart of real bad things Mm -hmm. and how the crime or is it a crime or not? If right. someone is abused and they need to um, protect themselves is a big right. uh, philosophical question. But like even with Casey Anthony, like it's, you know, not in that level of abuse or even it's a different it's a cho- it's an infant. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is it. Was she neglectful? What actually happened? Um, is it where it just uh, an accident was happened and then mm-hmm. she tried to cover it up, which is kind of more where I right. fall is <laughs> it got too far. Um, the lie just started to domino yeah. and you don't know where to um, you feel like you can't be honest anymore because mm. you're going to be um, you're going to be punished. But is it worth it to go through all of that? court of public opinion instead of telling the truth right I mean right (laughs) the question but um yeah like with Jane we know that she had a violent stepfather who like it's very clear she can she actually uh tells the town that she Mm -hmm. killed him it's not like right on the lying. first chapter, right? Yes, right in the first <laughs> chapter. This is not a secret to her. This isn't a secret even to Maud, to the residents. Right. But it's all been buried under the surface mm-hmm. for 25 years, literally buried. Like there's right. been no body. And then now a surprise body um, rises to the surface of the water and she actually has to face jail time. Mm-hmm. But it's an interesting conundrum like what do you do when someone actually confesses but they're not held to account in that moment but now she's 
held accountable 25 years later. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, what, what was so compelling? Because that is so compelling. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious, where did all of that origin come from mm-hmm. for you? I mean, the origin in general was, I mean, I did have a pretty shitty stepfather who was very, who was emotionally abusive. He was physically abusive toward my mother. And so, you know, it was a, that was, you know, referencing earlier, like my queerness is not the defining moments, but a lot of my defining moments are that domestic violence that, you know, my brother and I witnessed and were a part of. And, um, I think two blended families, you know, I have that a lot in my family and um, you don't see that a lot in fiction. And so I just, I wanted to bring those to the forefront. And then also I've always just had a big fear of drowning. So it was kind of taking these different ideas and I did want my stepfather to die. Hey, True Crime and Ivory Tower Boiler Room listeners, listen. The holidays are literally right around the corner. And I know that some of you are scrambling to find that gift for that person on your list who is just so difficult to buy for because they have everything. Or you're sitting there in your home and you're realizing that there is this space in your house that just is begging to be decorated, but you don't know what to put there. Well, I'm here to tell you that Mandy Made It has the answers to all of your holiday needs. Mandy Made It makes the best handmade crochet and cricut items I have ever seen. And I mean, literally, she can make anything. The customization options are literally endless. So go to at Mandy Made It on Instagram and search Mandy Made It on Facebook. Slide into her DMs and order your customized holiday gifts and decorations today. That's at Mandy Made It on Instagram. And Mandy is spelled M-A-N-D-E-E. Once again, search Mandy Made It on Instagram and Facebook. Slide in her DMs and order your gifts or holiday decorations today. The Ivory Tower Boiler Room is so happy to welcome Broadview Press as our official sponsor. Broadview Press is an independent academic publisher in the humanities that produces high quality, pedagogically useful books for use in university and college classrooms. They publish in the humanities, mainly in English studies, writing, philosophy, and history. They always publish with an eye towards diversity. So there is a strong list of titles from women, people of color, and other authors from marginalized groups. In the summer of 2022, they launched their new Broadview Anthology of American Literature, which increases diversity in the classroom because it rethinks the American canon and breathes new life into the American Literary Survey. It's actually been called, quote, the new gold standard in the field. I love using Broadview Press text in my own classroom at Stony Brook University. I can't wait to use the new anthology of American literature when I have the opportunity. And for all of you out there, Broadview Press has given us the official code, Ivory Tower, for 20% off site-wide on broadviewpress.com. Again, that is code Ivory Tower for 20% off. And it was kind of like, you know, I've, I've written, I feel like I've written his death many times over the years, but trying to find the right thing. And I'm one of those people, like, I'll get an idea, a nugget. And I just like, I'm a dog on a bone. I'm just like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to make this work. And it's been, you know, decades, but I figured out a way to kill him. So it was great. (laughs) So, but I also... I mean, when you go into something like this is what happened, you're also challenging the reader like, is it what happened? And I think that's what's fun about taking a more psychological approach as opposed to a a traditional mystery approach. And I, to be clear, I really love mysteries. I love whodunits, but I love all. And so I, I think sometimes it's just trying to get um, the publishing world to understand, like, we can do a different pattern here. We don't all have to follow the same um, 
steps in our books. Like it, not everything has to be a whodunit. Cause to me, that's not as exciting. Like it's fun, but the, the books that really stick with me is like Rebecca. That's another book that was oh, huge yes. for me. Right. Um, and VC Andrews, like all oh, that weird psychological shit. I love it. And so that's what I'm drawn to write. And so, but it is sometimes hard to get people to come along with you because they're like, why would I care? She's already confessed. And I'm like, but what did she confess to you? Mm-hmm. And why yeah. would she, why would she go home? So it, it creates these different questions that you have to kind of understand someone's psychology. And so, you know, talking about the court of public opinion and landing on one side, like yes or no, you know, black or white. And I, I like being able to dive into a character's psychology so we can get into more of that gray area and understand why they behaved in the way they did. And luckily some readers like that as well. <laughs> like, I'm so grateful <laughs> that people want to come along that ride with me because that's just fascinating to me. I just find it really, really compelling to read and write that. Yeah. Well, and I'm curious, are you close to, or do you know Megan Collins who wrote I... The Family Plot? We are mutuals. Oh, good. <laughs> Let's yeah. put it there. We're Twitter friends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just because um, I feel for everyone out there, real bad things is such a, you know, as you get bathhouse, mm-hmm. also add the family plot to your list with real bad things because that's another where we kind of already know who, not who, but we know mm-hmm. that there was a murder. We know who's murdered, and. I find that more compelling. I mean, I love, again, yes, I get the Christie's so intriguing. Yeah, I like the um, clue-like mysteries where you have to figure out who's murdered. Yeah, you you get involved in that type of setup. But I really like the more what I would say is psychologically realistic Mm -hmm. of the motives, the desires, the... How are they going to live their lives now? Who's Mm -hmm. in the family? Who is going to crumble and deteriorate because of these secrets? Um, And your novel really weighs a lot on Mm -hmm. um, family secrets and also allegiances. So, you know, how do you um, how do you feel not feel about those themes, but more? is that a really enjoyable process to try to figure out, you know, what secrets you're going to unearth and what's really going to start to uh, crumble and break this house down? Right. I will say that's the harder part for me, (laughs) which is why I rely on PJ Vernon is my beta reader because I do tend, especially in my first few drafts, it's very character heavy. It's very depressing. Um, And so, you know, I need PJ and my wife both kind of pull me back from the depressing parts as much as they can. And they're like, let's have something else going on here. So, um, so it, it is harder for me. I do enjoy it, but it's, it's also, it doesn't come easy. I really have to think about it and really plot it out. But I always start those first few drafts with character and intention and psychology. And then I add in some of the more plot elements, but I feel like because I've done all that hard work and a lot of it I've thrown out, I, I'm able to quickly figure out little clues and little pieces and be like, what could that be? And I'm like, Oh, I mentioned that way back in chapter four. (laughs) So that'll work. Um, so I think having a ton of material is is good for having those plot um, thoughts and figuring out how it all connects together. But it's not easy. It's really yeah. hard. <laughs> like those are the points where I'm like, why did I want to be a writer? <laughs> yeah, well, and it's so interesting because, you know, as a literary scholar, I'm always just fascinated with these interviews because of that process of, the art of writing, say, a novel, or, Mm -hmm. I mean, um, as this comes out, we've had Richie Hoffman, who is 
a uh, queer male poet. And like, I even get into him with, has he thought about writing novels? And like, what is the difference between mm -hmm. these genres? And like, I'm so drawn to when you were interviewed by the Lambda Literary um, organization, which mm -hmm. I love Lambda Literary with LGBTQ plus yes. fiction um, and write and poetry and all, all literature. Um, and they said that you really know how to present how the body, mind, and soul deteriorates mm -hmm. in the South rural areas, but just generally, you know how to make a character's <laughs> deterioration show. Right. Um, so like, do you feel that? Cause those themes are present in all genres of literature. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that for you writing a novel, what does that allow you to do then say, if you tried to capture this in a poem, mm -hmm. like what, you know, have you weighed those mm -hmm. aspects when you're writing? Yeah, absolutely. And I actually started writing poetry. That was the first thing I ever started, you know, junior high, wrote tons of it. Uh, and I continued that until I was about 25, 26. Um, so a long period there, but I also played around with screenplays and um, short stories, which I'm terrible at. And um you know, novels. And I had thought at points about doing, like I've taken essay writing classes. I'm a dabbler. I like to dabble in all the arts and kind of see what fits. Like I did photography, I did animation. I just like to, to kind of see, right. Um, what is it? Is that like the Goldilocks thing? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which one fits? Oh, yes, um, yes, yes. Yeah, I was and trying it's to the think. Just right. Just yes. right is always the. <laughs> so for me, no, the novel is just right, because I think I mean, poetry and short stories, you have to be so precise in such a small space. And I am very tangential just by nature. I love, I love tangents. Um, and it takes me forever to get to a point, but that's just who I am. So novels are much better fit for me. And I still have problems and they're like, could we just like cut these two chapters? <laughs> so I just had to do that recently too on a book that's nearly done. Ooh. So it's, it's not going away, but um, I think too, you know, I, I had taken essay classes and I find it very hard to tap into the past Um it's just, it's hard for me. I, I'm still, you know, I'm a nice Southern girl kind of at heart and I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. And um, so for me, it's, it's kind of easier to kind of fictionalize things, but it's not auto fiction what I'm writing. You know, it might come, you could say the ideas are auto fiction, but it's just a kernel of an idea. It's a start. And then it goes, it blooms into something that's entirely not me, but of me, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you would feel uncomfortable doing like memoir. Oh my God. Essays. Never. Not okay. ever. <laughs> no, like yeah. essays maybe, but they make me so uncomfortable. Like I just had one, an essay up on crime reads and I wanted to rip my skin off because it's just really hard it's hard to to not fictionalize things there's comfort in fiction there's a place to hide yeah when you're writing a memoir you're there's... you know this is your journey and mm -hmm. your reflection on the world but I do always think there has to be there's a you're always fictionalizing aspects even right. in your memory right exactly like we, we can't always rely on how we've pieced mm -hmm. together um, memories just because, well, you know, right. we were into psychology. There's the memory is a hard testimony to have in court. LGBT stories are universal, but each one speaks to the individual heart and soul of the writer telling it. Do you have a story to tell? Have you been moved by an LGBT book, film, painting, television show, or other form of media? If so, the Gay and Lesbian Review wants to hear from you. The GNLR believes in bringing awareness to queer art and artists through reviews, commentary, and thought pieces in which the author relates their personal lives to a particular piece of art, a novel, a movie, or what have you. In addition to the articles published in the print magazine, the GNLR also publishes articles on its blog, as well as personal essays on its 
popular Here's My Story section. This allows people like you to share their own experiences with our readers. To learn more about submitting either to the print or the online edition of the GNLR, visit GLReview.org. That's G L R E V I E W dot O R G. And scroll down to the bottom of the page to find a link to their writer's guidelines. If you have questions, email me at stephen.hemrick at georeview.org. The GNLR can't wait to see what you have to say. Do you have a queer fascination with classic films? Ever wish you'd be transported back to that golden age of cinema as if you're in the movies themselves? Hi, my name is Christian Garcia, and I am the host of that old gay classic cinema. Join my friends and I as we travel back in time to that classic age of film and peel back the layers of how these films transformed our view behind the camera and into the lens of cinema. Make sure to follow my Instagram at that old gay classic cinema, and I'll be sure to see if you see at our next showing. See you there. Yeah, um, it is. You know, and but people it's remember different things, right? Yeah. Like the characters in Real Bad Things, Jane and her brother Jason, they remember different things. And that's yeah. that's something that so many siblings, I, you know, friends with siblings, that's that's our thing. It's like, oh, I didn't remember it. It's it's an interesting thing when you get older and you realize that very strong memories you had with your sibling that shared memory is actually very fractured and different. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, oh, wow, fascinating how that works. And, you know, I love reading nonfiction. love it. I love memoir. And I, I think um, it was Alex Marzano Lesnovich who wrote The Fact of a Body. Oh. I don't know if you've read that. No. So if you're I'll super into list. Southern Gothic, it's memoir. It's a braided narrative. So it's memoir and nonfiction. Um and it involves um, a, someone on death row. Um, and they were, Alex was, I believe, an attorney's assistant. Technically, he has a law degree. Anyway, it's a wonderful book. And I remember they were talking about it. And it's, it's the memory. The books are not about facts. The books are about truth. Mm. And even truth can be different depending on who's telling the story. So it's a really fascinating narrative too about how attorneys craft their arguments in courts. Um, it's all storytelling. Yeah, well, so, lawyers are, I think they are such versatile um, <laughs> Uh, performers. Like storytellers. Yes, they have to know, yes, they <laughs> right, have to know how performers. to deliver. Right. Um, they're literally training and acting methods um but and there's an art of rhetoric right. i mean it's the whole art of rhetoric there but yeah and i think you know as we're wrapping up which went by so quickly i know it did <laughs> i know but i also am a very referential tangential person uh which is where podcasting works so well to dig into these i topics. think that's the fun pieces that come out it is because I don't know. I mean, I've always, some have asked me, can you do like a 10 minute quick interview with someone? And I'm like, I can't dig into the <laughs> depths. Like right. I, you know, to me, that's different. That's a publicity interview. That's right. very, okay. Why would we want to buy this? Which that's a blog course, post. <laughs> yeah, right. just, but of course I want everyone to buy real bad things. Um, but at the same time, I'm so curious about, how you grappled and wrestled really with, you know, not revealing this to everyone out there, mm -hmm. but what's the process of actually thinking about the memory of, is Jane going to reveal to the reader how she murdered mm -hmm. her stepfather? Like, how am I going to present that as the writer? Am I even going to do that? Should I leave the ambiguity? You know, because mm -hmm. I, I would assume that was one of the, hardest questions in the narrative is actually presenting the details 
it it I mean it's it's the suspense piece. Mm-hmm. It's really hard to kind of figure out when and where in a narrative you decide to reveal what. And um, sometimes you're just going by a gut feeling like with cotton mouse, you know, turning back just a little, cause um, it's a better example. You know, I had, I had workshopped it. I had done a ton of things with it and everybody was like, you should really move this one critical mm. piece to the beginning. Like everybody's like, what is it? Start in, in media res. I always say it incorrectly. Oh yeah. Like in the middle right? of things. Right. Mm. And mm-hmm. it just didn't feel right. And so I, I kind of, you know, wrestled with that for a while, but I had read another book, um, Steve Yarbrough's, oh, I can't remember the name of it now, but um, it's got, it's got Piggly Wiggly on the cover. <laughs> okay. So well, everyone really out there, start, book, right? start, start search, <laughs> searching on Google. This is why you need very specific book covers, because when you forget, right? Oh, The End of California, I believe it's called. So there's an event in his book that happens midway through. And I was like, there you go. It can happen. And so that was really confidence building. So a lot of it is, for me, a gut feeling. But also, I, I read a ton. I read for structure. So, you know, Gillian Flynn is perfect for that. Um, oh, yes. I love Jamie Attenberg's The Middle Steens, which is not crime, but I love the way that it's, it's structured with all the different points of view. Um, so I go- I'm wearing through... my guru, which is Stephen King. Oh, of course, of course. When right? it comes to suspense and horror, yeah. I mean, his beginnings are not horrific. No. It, no, it's- there's a lot of setting the stage, I yeah. think, in, Bill, in Stephen oh, King. Oh, definitely, definitely. And I I mean, like every Gen X kid and probably every other kid, teenager, many American teenagers, we read a lot of Stephen King in junior high, yeah. right? I certainly did. So yeah, it's it's trying to figure out how to do the suspense, but it's kind of part of the fun of it as well, of writing. It's like, what can you do here? And then you just rely, you do your best and then that's why we have beta readers <laughs> so they can help us. And that's why we have editors and agents because um, you want it to be something that's really compelling. And, you know, I always go back to that feeling. I always felt around the fire when my dad and my uncle Larry were telling stories and I'm, I'm always trying to put myself in that state of being um, surprised and also scared and something that resonates with me, you know, and that's what I want in a book, something that resonates beyond the last page where I'm still thinking about some of the stories my dad told me 30, 40 years ago. And I want readers and I want as a reader to have that experience as well. Mm. Yeah, well, and I think as we, you know, just conclude i really loved um donna post postal donna postal's reading she's uh, great real bad things yes and you know my question is do you now that you are as far away from real bad things (laughs) as you can be now that it's out um have you thought about it being it existing outside the page. Like, have you thought about now that there is an audiobook? Have you thought about, oh, okay, this actually could work for, say, the screen or in another iteration, mm-hmm. just because of the psychological thriller aspects, which plays so well on the screen? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. And that's, that's in the hands of people who are far more qualified than I am and have better connections than I do. So, you know, if it's, it's one of those things, like it's always a dream, but it's always, you know, a crapshoot as published, you know, putting things on screen is, you know, a harder than getting things in publishing. So, you know, you're grateful for whatever you get, but um, yeah, it's kind of out of our hands. So I just try to write the best book I can. And, you know, I try to make myself happy first with what I'm writing. It, you know, I have to love the story because I'm going to sit with it, what, like 20 years. <laughs> so I better enjoy it. Yeah. 
Well, this has been so wonderful, Kelly. Um, Kelly Ford, the writer of Real Bad Things. You could get it anywhere books are sold. I have a link to it in our show notes on bookshop.org. Um, I have the Audible link. So you, if you like myself, I love going back and forth from audiobooks to uh, reading, you know, the actual paper <laughs> copy. Um, I still haven't gotten into digital books yet, but that's because <laughs> I love just holding a book. Um, so Kelly, this has been wonderful. I feel like you gave us so much knowledge of how to write a psychological thriller, <laughs> which might even be the title of this episode. We'll oh. see. <laughs> how to write a psychological thriller. <laughs> Perfect. I'll have to re-listen to it because I'm like, how do I? <laughs> I feel like every time I go to the page, it's like relearning. Oh no. Are you still there? Okay. No, I'm but somehow here, yeah, I yeah. managed to to hit my my um music anyway. See, I move a lot too. I'm like tangential. Oh, no, that's like good. This. <laughs> well, this so has been really fun though. Thank you. Yes. And I can't wait to see hear what you have coming out next. So you know, are you able to reveal that yet? Or I know you're just yes. at the end. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, no, it's, um, I'm in, at the end of developmental edit. So basically, you know, it should be coming out. <laughs> There's, they've accepted it so far. Um, okay. But yeah, it's, it's based on, it's called The Hunt tentatively. Who knows if they'll change it. Um, it's with Thomas and Mercer, the same publisher as Real Bad Things. And it's based on a um, classic radio station, Hunt for the Golden Egg from my hometown, <laughs> which everyone's just like, I don't understand, but it works. Trust me. Um, but yeah, there's there's um, the town. So again, going back to that court of public opinion, because I do also love that kind of TMZ kind of feel. I yeah. hate TMZ, but I love the feel of it, right? Um, so the town is kind of split between whether or not there is a serial killer who is using the hunt for the golden egg as their hunting ground, or if oh, it's wow. a series of accidents Whoa. that is pla okay. that has plagued the town for 17 years. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So a legacy of a serial killer. Yes. Uh, okay. Well, this uh, <laughs> is definitely, you're not uh, going away from uh, no. thrilling murderous topics. Um, so Not definitely <laughs> come back here, Kelly, when the hunt or its other iteration title comes out. Um, Perfect. I would love to have you back. And Absolutely. thank you again. I'd love for, to come back. Yes. And thank you again for doing this. And, you know, this really fits the fall theme. We're still True. in the psychological horror thriller realm. So, yes, I can't wait to have everyone out there you know, message us, you know, message Kelly on Instagram, message me, Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Let us know what you think of real bad things. And yeah, I can't wait for more people to dig into this, Kelly. Awesome. Well, thank you yeah. so much. I truly do appreciate it. It's just wonderful talking with you. Of course, of course. Okay. Well, have a great day, Kelly. You too. And bye to everyone out there. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Hi, Ivory Tower Boiler Room audience. It is Andrew Rimby, the director of the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. Welcome to our winter season. And are you trying to stay warm this season? Well, guess what? We have the Ivory Tower Boiler Room Cafe. It is our Patreon where there is so much bonus content. So I'll go over all that. But first, it's only $5, which is less then a latte, a cappuccino, a coffee, a tea, basically anything now because, you know, we have some inflation going on. So join us on our Patreon, patreon.com slash ivory tower boiler room. What do you get? You get Gregory Maguire giving us all the scoop on the Wicked Movie musical. You get Jesse Green giving us his hot takes on the Broadway musical. If you don't know who Jesse is, well, you should, because he's the chief theater critic of the New York Times. You get all the JFK and Marilyn Monroe scoop from Elizabeth Winder, a Marilyn Monroe biographer. So much more. You get all our video interviews. You can see everything, including the bonus content. And Mary's going to tell you from True Crime and Academia what you get later. But 
If you're not following us on social media and seeing our video teasers, well, you need that to stay, you know, nice and energized on these winter days. So follow us on Instagram and TikTok at Ivory Tower Boiler Room. While it's still here, why don't you follow us on Twitter at Ivory Boiler Room? And here's my chief contributor, Mary. Hey, true crime friends and Ivory Tower Boiler Room friends. Like Andrew said, you're going to get access to all of this bonus content. That includes true crime and academia. So not only will you have access to the bonus episode each month, you will also have video access to the interviews that I conduct on my podcast once a month. You get all of that extra content at your fingertips whenever you feel like watching it, literally for a cup of coffee. So why don't you just buy us one? That'd be so nice. We would appreciate that because we love your support already, but we could use a little bit more if you don't Oh, mind. yes, we could. And also, hey, do you all know you can actually DM us questions at our social media channels? Yes. Also, why don't you ask us questions with our social media posts? We love it. We even shout out questions on our episodes. And if you want, you can always email us at ivorytowerboilerroom at gmail.com to actually order our merchandise. So mm -hmm. we have hats, we have t-shirts, we have posters, we have everything. If you want any merchandise with the Ivory Tower Boiler Room logo, we're going to make it happen for you. Okay, on that note, happy winter season, everyone. Happy winter. <laughs>